everyone, welcome back to my channel. Um, if you're new around here and you've never seen any of my videos before, my name is Charlotte and I am a writer, I'm a historian and a heritage researcher. I have written two books about the country house and about women's history in connection to the country house and I'm basically interested in anything heritage, anything history, anything literature. Um, I absolutely love books, I have a passion for writing and for reading and yeah I kind of produce videos on this channel about what it's like to be a writer, about what books I read, I do book reviews and hints and tips and tricks on how you can become a writer as well. This channel is also called Charlotte and Tom <laughs> and the Tom half of it is my husband and together we produce vlogs and video diaries on travel, lifestyle and the renovation of our house which is in the background. <laughs> so that's a little bit of history about me, a little bit of information about me and yeah we're here today because I wanted to introduce something to you. Oh, It's here! It's finally here! We have been waiting for this for so long. And when I say we, I mean me, Tom, my family, my friends, and the lovely community who follow me on YouTube. I feel like this book particularly has been a labour of intense, intense love over the last two years. It has been hard to produce this book. But it's here. I'm not going to dwell on the negatives because it's here in all its lovely glory. And it's got a dust jacket. It is a hardback. And it's called oh, Unmarried Women of the Country Estate. And it focuses on four stories from the 1600s all the way up to the 1900s. And it's four individual women. And it's basically their story of why they decided to remain single. What enabled them to be able to remain single clue, money, um, and what they did instead, instead of marrying. Um, and that's kind of the, a very, very quick rundown of what it's about. I picked four women who I thought were really interesting and I researched them for about 12 months um, and then spent the next 18 months trying to write their story and do justice to them. Um, and this is the final product. I'm so happy with the cover. It's so beautiful. This is this is Shibden Hall at the bottom, um, and this is Anne Lister in the centre here. And Anne Lister ran and lived at Shibden Hall and owned it um, in the 1800s. And then on this side here, this is Rosalie Chichester. She's the latest lady in the book. She was um, born at, at the end of the 1800s and actually died in 1951. I'm really bad at dates, I'm sorry. I know as a historian and a writer you should be good at dates, but I'm not. Um, but yeah, she's the latest lady. Um, she was amazing. And then this lady over here is Anne Robinson, and she was she lived in the 1700s, and she um, basically gave up any idea of becoming um, a wife because her sister died um, prematurely and left behind two children, and so she became like a spinster nanny for her sister's children instead. Um, now it does say four women, um, this little byline here, I don't know if you can quite read it, it says four stories from the 17th to 20th century, but you will notice there's only three women on the cover. And the reason for that is that the earliest woman in this study, Elizabeth Isham, was actually born during the 1600s and there is no surviving portrait of her that we know of at the moment. So unfortunately she couldn't go on the cover and I didn't really want to put some random woman on the cover who um, maybe, you know, it'd be a contemporary portrait of the 17th century but it wouldn't be her so that didn't really seem fair. So that's why there's only three women on the front but actually I I think out of the four Elizabeth Isham's story is probably one of my favourite. Um, so what I thought I would do is just give you a little excerpt from the book and I'm actually going to read you a little bit from Elizabeth Elizabeth Isham's chapter. Um, so Elizabeth was born in 1608 and she died in 1654. So you can see that it's like basically spans the entirety of the 17th century. And she was born and raised at um, a little country house called Lamport Hall in Northamptonshire, which not a lot of people have heard of. Um, it's very close to my heart because I actually did a master's degree in heritage studies and I was an intern at Lamport whilst I was doing my master's and I actually lived there as well. Um, I lived in the old servants quarters at the top of the house and it was just 
the most amazing two years of my life was working and, and living there. Um, but she lived there in the, 17, in the 1600s, like I say, and as the eldest daughter, she was expected to make quite a dynastic marriage, um, quite an advantageous marriage that would have set the family in good stead um, and all that kind of stuff. They'd only really been owners of Lamport for the previous kind of 50, 60 years and they were very much trying to cement their position in society and so Elizabeth marrying somebody um, with wealth and connection in the county would have been quite a coup for the family. Um, but she was very religious, um, was Elizabeth. She was a Puritan um, in that very, very key pivotal point of the Civil War and the Interregnum and all that kind of stuff. Puritanism was, was really on the rise and she was part of a Puritan family and her mother was really religious as well. In fact, her mother kind of suffered with almost like a religious melancholia, which was, um, it's a form of mental health where people who suffered with low mental health or suffered with mental health problems focused very much on the idea that those problems must have come from um, religious kind of, um, what's the word I'm think, trying to think of? Come from a religious deficit in their lives so they're not being religious enough they're not observing religion enough and therefore that's led to them becoming quite melancholic um so her mother suffered with all sorts of problems and but she was a very strict puritan and she taught elizabeth um the kind of the ways of the church within the home which was very common in that time you know mothers often passed on religious teachings to children and the household in general and so when elizabeth grew up and became the age that she would have married um she was kind of a conflict with herself she was very interested in reading and um she was very interested in the bible and in her religion and she took that very seriously and she felt that god spoke to her on a, a number of different levels and she wasn't sure whether god was telling her to marry or to stay single and she wrote this incredible book later on in life which was called her book of remembrance and it's basically a bit of an autobiography of her life up until that point and um but it's almost addressed to god it's as if she's remembering her life and she's explaining why she did what she did and she's explaining how she wanted to live a religious life and within this book she talks a lot about um, the conflict that she feels between giving herself up to god and marrying god and becoming um very religious she never decides to join a convent or an abbey or anything like that um, this is after the dissolution of the monasteries and that was very much a catholic thing was going into a monastery so i don't want you to think this kind of oh well, why didn't she just become a nun because by that point there weren't really a lot of nunneries left and actually as a puritan she probably wouldn't have been interested in um living in a convent or anything like that puritans very much uh, practice their religion within the home within the self and that's very much what you see from elizabeth um so yeah she gets to um kind of the age that you would expect her to marry she's about 18 years old and she meets um a neighbor called john dryden who is the family of um Cannons Ashby, which is not too far away from Lamport Hall, and they're quite um, a well-known family in the area, but they're in the very much the same position as the Aishans. They're trying to cement their position in society. Um, they only really acquired their property in the mid-1500s, so they're kind of similar kind of stage as the Aishams, and so there was this kind of expectation that the marriage of the two families together would be really advantageous on both sides. And Elizabeth meets John and there's just this beautiful courtship that she describes in her book of remembrance where they kind of got to know each other and um, there's some letters that survive that yeah he writes to her in 1631 he says sweetheart never was time so tedious to me as this since my departure from you though to my thinking never was time spent better spent Never was spent time better that came to less perfection. Thy constant love makes me plain-hearted, therefore, sweetheart, excuse these lines and return me answer as pleases your sweet self. It is very, you can see that he feels very affectionate towards her. And she, um, she's caught very much between feeling a lot of affection and love for this man, but also wondering whether her calling is to become a wife or not and she says I wondered if he should be my husband because I had so few thoughts of him yet when he was long absent 
I should with much vehemency think of him, fearing he was not well, but then I was jealous of myself, lest I should offend God in my affections, which I thought was too strong for man. Again, I thought how well, how well I should chance to break off that I might think of marriage no more, but that I might with more freeness serve thee, God, without thoughts of human love. So you can see that in that excerpt from her book, she's worrying about John when she doesn't hear from him very much, even though she's a bit confused that she doesn't feel like her, her emotions are strong enough to show that she's in love with him. But then clearly when he doesn't come round for a few days, she's like, oh, where is he? Is he okay? I hope he's not ill. So you can tell there's affection there between the two of them. But at the same time, she's really worried about um, her relationship with God and what that means. Um, and I don't want to read too much from the book because I'm really hoping that you go and buy it, surprisingly. Um, and I want you to kind of read about their courtship and everything that happened. Um, but unfortunately, John died. Um, there was a lot of to in and fro in between the families. Um, a dowry couldn't be agreed upon. And there was a lot of financial issues um, that basically her father and John's grandfather couldn't agree on. And in the delay, Elizabeth got cold feet and she decided that maybe this wasn't the right thing for her. And so she told her father to stop um, negotiating she said I'm, I, you know i don't want you to lower yourself anymore to these people i'm not interested anymore and then before she really has time to think about it and decide whether she does actually want to marry him unfortunately john died and so that whole incident kind of ended and she didn't really get a chance to um make that choice and of course for her she saw that as a sign from god that she was actually supposed to remain single and she remained single for the rest of her life um, but she wrote the most amazing autobiography which is actually considered to be quite rare in the time um, especially with the tone that it's written in with the religious overtones and the fact that she addresses it to God um, it's really rare and unique and so it's what it, when I found Elizabeth's autobiography and I read it in its entirety I'd read a couple of articles and studies on her work that were very much about the religion and about the kind of um, the faith behind it and the theology behind it. But when I was reading it, all I kept seeing is this kind of woman, this, this young woman who in many ways was suffering with the same kind of uncertainties and the same um, questions as any young person today would do. And yet she lived over 400 years ago. And that really captured my attention and my kind of intrigue. And I was so... Um, sorry, guys, my camera batteries just died. Um, I did not died sorry my camera's just overheated which happens all the time so i'm really really sorry i'm gonna change onto my phone because i don't really want to lose the momentum i'm really enjoying talking about it um so yeah when i found her book and i read through and i was just absolutely enthralled by her the character and her personality that really comes through in this autobiography and so that's why i included her in the study and she really was the woman who made me then think i wonder who who else I can discover, um, who, who which other stories I can come across of women who didn't marry, um, and I kind of come across a couple of the other stories. I come across Anne Robinson when I was researching my first book, and obviously I knew about Anne Lister, um, and so I kind of did a little bit of delving, a little bit of digging, and came across these four women um, and they were all in different centuries and so I thought actually this could be quite a good opportunity for me to write about each woman in a separate chapter um, but actually we can travel chronologically from the 1600s all the way up to the 1900s and we can do a very basic introduction to marriage and expectations of women during each century. So that's what I've tried to do in it. Um, I hope it works <laughs> and I hope it's uh, I hope it reads well. Um it's it's very much an introduction and that's one thing that I do kind of want to state quite heavily is that you know I'm not saying that I'm an expert in any of these women's stories or an expert in marriage throughout the centuries. What I want to do really with this book and with all the books I write is to inspire you to go out and to find out more about these women and find out more about similar stories. And just inspire people to fall in love with the stories and the histories of the individuals in heritage because it's very easy to just see the big house on the hill and assume that every single person who lived there was rich and conceited and didn't give a shit and all that kind of stuff and 
there were some people that were like that, but there are also some amazing stories of women and individuals who um, had the same problems that every, every person does, has the same um, kind of questions about life and the same problems that they have to face on a day-to-day -day basis. And this book in particular is close to my heart because it's women really kicking ass. <laughs> um and that's what i love about it you know we know the story of Anne lister very well um especially because of the recent show gentleman jack i'd already actually picked to do Anne lister and was already well within the research when um it was announced that gentleman jack was going to be produced and i really hope that i've kind of got her story um done justice to her story as with all of the women's stories in the book um but with her i focused less on the relationships because it is it is a bit strange to see Anne Lister with the word unmarried underneath her. Um, and in my opinion, Anne Lister wasn't unmarried. In my opinion, she did marry, but she married a woman. Um, I'm sure you all know this. I'm sure you've all um, seen Gentleman Jack, but just in case you haven't, Anne Lister was a lesbian and she lived in a time when being gay for a man was still very, very, very much taboo. But being gay for a woman, it was a little bit more blurred in terms of how it was accepted by society, how it was accepted legally, that kind of thing. Um, one thing that was absolutely couldn't happen was, you know, women couldn't marry women. Uh, gay marriages couldn't, you know, just couldn't. Well, they could take part, which is what happens in the book. Anne Lister does marry um, her life partner, Anne. Um, and they do get married in my eyes and in the eyes of God, but um, they kind of have a secret ceremony. It's not legally recognised at the time. Um, so in terms of societal expectations, she remained an unmarried spinster for the rest of her, for all of her life, really. Um, but my argument is that actually she wasn't really unmarried. She married Anne Walker instead. Um, but I've included her in this because I think it's a really interesting kind of contrast to the other women's stories. Um, and it just means that we can have a commentary on societal expectations of women during that period. Um, so yeah, I've rambled on about the book for a little bit. I hope um, that's given you a little bit of information on what it's about um, and why I wrote it. And why I really, really hope that you buy it and read it for yourself. Not not just because it supports me as a writer. I mean, obviously it does. If you buy it, it supports me financially and it, it enables me to be able to go on and read, write more books and um, discover more women's stories and tell them to you. Um, but I actually really just want you to buy it because these women are amazing and it's been an absolute privilege to spend time researching their stories and to write them out. And I think more people need to know about them. Specifically, the three women, Elizabeth Isham, Rosalie Chichester and Anne Robinson, because their stories are a little bit less known than Anne Lister's. But nevertheless, all four women deserve um, for their stories to be remembered and to be looked at. So yeah, here, here it is again. It's Unmarried Women of the Country Estate, four stories from the 17th to the 20th century. Yeah, can't really say much more than that. Other than that, really, yep, I really hope you like it and uh, let me know in the comments if you have bought it and what you think of it. Um, be nice, be kind <laughs> to myself and to everyone else in the comments. And uh, yeah, I will be back again with another video in the near future. Stay safe and uh, keep yourself well. Wear your mask, don't forget. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I will see, oh, oh, no. While I think on, if you want a signed copy of the book, let me know um, because I need to speak to the publisher about how we're going to handle that. Obviously, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, I need to find out how we're handling signed copies. So if you particularly want a signed copy of the book, um, then either let me know in comments or get in touch with me privately on social media and we'll sort that out. If you just want a general copy, then head over to my publisher's website, which is in the description box. And yeah, get yourself a copy. They make great Christmas presents. Great Christmas presents. They make great Christmas presents. Right, I'm going now. <laughs> Bye.